Hi, everybody. Welcome to our rounds, the second one for uh, January. We have Dr. Baird today with us um, from Moncton, New Brunswick, and I'll pass it over to her. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak. Um, my name is Carolyn Baer. I'm a general internist in, uh, in Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Training and Education Working Group of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, uh, which is a national organization promoting uh, women's heart health. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, acute coronary syndromes in women. Um, so before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that the land on which I live is the traditional unceded territory of the Willistiquit, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, and today this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Um, so this slide deck that I'm going to show you has undergone peer review. It is evidence-based at the time of um, publication, and I do not have any conflicts to declare. Um, so the learning objectives, at the end of this module, you will be able to A, recognize the presentation characteristics when women present with acute coronary syndrome, outline the assessment and management strategies for ACS, identify the additional challenges presented by younger women with ACS, uh, appraise the literature related to ACS in women, and if there's time, we'll talk about specific examples such as uh, Minoka or MI with no obstructive coronary artery disease, um, and possibly spontaneous coronary artery dissection, although I'm not sure we'll have time for that. Um, so before we start, I just want to um, introduce you to the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance Atlas. Um, this is published on CJC Open, so it's free, it's available to everyone. There will be nine chapters. We've got five chapters completed so far, and they, um, they look at, uh, there's an introduction to talk about the scope of the problem, uh, patient perspectives, disparities across the lifespan, uh, going all the way up to knowledge gaps and uh, next steps. So this is just an example. Uh, so chapter two is the scope of the problem. Um, so coronary artery disease or CAD and MI are accountable for the majority of CV deaths in women. Uh, the majority of CV disease related eMERGE visits uh, by women are for uh, coronary artery disease, stroke, heart failure, and atrial fib. Um, after childbirth, CV disease is the leading cause of hospitalization in women. Um, there are disparities in uh, cardiovascular risk that go beyond sex, such as indigenous status, ethnic variation, for example, higher risk in Afro-Caribbean and South Asian women. Uh, as well as uh, issues with uh, women with disabilities, um, living in rural areas. So the more rural area, uh, less populous areas have higher CV risk, for example, uh, being of lower socioeconomic status. And then gender, which is a social construct, also has an impact. And then finally, traditional risk factors uh, affect women differently. And then there are women specific uh, cardiac risk factors. So this is just an illustration of cardiovascular disease throughout the lifespan of a woman from menarche to menopause. Um, so there are pregnancy related issues with uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and gestational diabetes that have an excess lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. Polycystic ovarian syndrome um, also increases cardiovascular risk. And then women also have a higher risk of depression and uh, have a higher incidence of autoimmune disease, uh, both of which increase risk. So back to ACS. And I'm gonna start just with a, a case study. So a 60 year old black woman presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath, sorry, chest pressure and fatigue for two hours uh, duration. She has a past history of hypertension for which she's on a diuretic and she is a current smoker. Her physical exam is normal, and this is her ECG. So uh, I'm sure you all see that there's ST elevation in the infralateral leads consistent with a, uh, an acute ST elevation MI in the infralateral uh, part of the heart. So let's just talk about what acute coronary syndrome is. So it refers to a range of clinical presentations. So ST elevation MI, 
non-ST elevation MI, and unstable angina. And the usual mechanism for acute MI is rupture of a coronary plaque, and then a totally occluding thrombus, which then leads to an ST elevation MI, as in the case I just presented. So compared with men, women more commonly present with actually with non-ST elevation MI or partially occluded plaque and non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, there was a uh, an investigation, uh, the WISE investigators, uh, which stands for Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation. Um, and they've provided important information on our current understanding of ischemic heart disease in women. So women are also more likely to have other mechanisms of coronary artery disease, such as spontaneous coronary artery dissection, coronary spasm, plaque erosion rather than plaque rupture. Um, and then MINOCA or MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries um, is twice as common in women compared to men. This entity really has no diagnostic distinguishing clinical presentation features compared with MI that with obstruction. Um, so it makes the diagnosis much more challenging in women. Um, ST elevation MI or STEMI can be present with non-obstructive coronary artery disease in about 33% of patients presenting uh, to hospital with uh, MI, according to at least one study. Um, so this is really just the textbook uh, spectrum of pathology that leads to acute coronary syndrome. So you have a, a plaque that you have a plaque, it ruptures generally. Um, if you have an occluding thrombus, you get ST elevation, you get an S a STEMI and you follow that, that pathway of treatment. If you have just partially occluding thrombus, you get usually ST segment depression, but not always. If your biomarkers are not elevated, it's unstable angina. If your biomarkers are elevated, we call it a non-ST elevation MI. Um, so that's basically the, how we diagnose and how we decide what treatment uh, we're going to use. So in women though, things aren't always as per the textbook diagram that I just showed you. So again, we're gonna talk a little bit about Minoka and I, I can go into more detail um, at, at, at the, later in, this, in the talk. Um, so results from a large meta-analysis showed that about 6% of acute MIs occurred in the absence of any obstructive coronary artery disease. Within a population of women less than the age of 50, presenting with acute coronary syndrome, the prevalence of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, where the, the artery is dissect, has a dissection, um, can be up to 35%. The exact incidence is still debated. Um, as well, more than half of women who present with Minoka have concomitant microvascular dysfunction, which is associated with traditional risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking, as well as sex-related uh, risk factors, including autoimmune disease and breast cancer therapies. Um, coronary microvascular dysfunction is also associated with heart failure, especially in women. So the diagnosis of Minoka is considered after um, angiography is performed at the time of presentation. Um, so sex-specific pathophysiological mechanisms exist in the development of coronary atherosclerosis. In most women presenting with ACS, the underlying mechanism is due to the formation of thrombus, as I showed you, caused by the rupture of a plaque with subsequent limitation of blood flow. And that's the same in men and women. However, women, especially younger women, are more likely to present with plaque erosion, where there's a discontinuation of the endothelium without evidence of plaque rupture of the fibrous cap. Sex differences in atherosclerosis formation and plaque instability are not completely understood. Estrogen may play a role in slowing lesion pro progression through decreased inflammatory activation, increased vasodilation, decreased LDL oxidation, which might potentially explain the lower prevalence of obstructive CAD and plaque rupture in premenopausal women. So there's also sex differences in the clinical presentation and demographics in acute coronary syndrome, which need to be noted. So overall, women have more comorbidities when they present, particularly hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, depression, and renal dysfunction, and that makes their management much more complex and challenging. A number of studies have shown that women present later for assessment and treatment of acute coronary syndrome compared to men. 
The majority of women aged 18 to 55 who are diagnosed with acute MI present with chest pain, similar in proportion to men. So it's about 87% of women and 89.5% of men present with chest pain as their initial complaint. But women also experience a greater number and variation of symptoms, so type, frequency, and quality, including prodromal symptoms, which are more unique to women, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, and sleep disturbance. And this may delay evaluation and diagnosis. Others have reported chest symptoms that are common in all patients diagnosed with ACS, but women experience more nausea, shoulder and upper back pain, and diaphoresis or sweating. This varied pattern and distribution of symptoms makes it difficult for healthcare providers and women themselves to interpret their symptoms as cardiac specific. So it's crucial to recognize that a patient might be having a myocardial infarction since any delay is critical and, result in, and results in poorer outcomes. Atypical symptoms are much more likely to occur in younger women. Um, so differences in presentation and symptoms become less related to sex differences at older age. So the assessment and management of younger women, less than 55, I feel old, old every time I, I give this talk, is particularly challenging uh, as I'll show in the next sl few slides. So sex differences in clinical presentation of ischemic heart disease are more pronounced in younger women, aged less than 55 with acute MI, who are more likely to present without chest pain and have higher in-hospital mortality. In older women over the age of 65, Sex differences are less pronounced. However, it's important to note that 50% of women over the age of 55 diagnosed with MI present without any chest discomfort. Longer pre-hospital delays have been reported in women with chest pain who are over 75 years and shorter pre-hospital delays reported in women under 55 who have additional or associated symptoms like shortness of breath or fatigue. Pre-hospital delay times are shorter in women who have an abrupt onset of symptoms versus a gradual onset, making one wonder if delays are related to symptom recognition and or interpretation or the actual decision to seek care. Women are generally older than men when diagnosed with a mean of 20 years older and have a higher prevalence of comorbid conditions as I mentioned earlier. Nevertheless, women aged 20 to 74 are more likely to die within one year of an MI. It's a big range, but for women, it's 60 to 195 per thousand um, deaths in women versus about 21 to 175 per thousand in men. Women post-MI are also more likely to have heart failure or stroke. Poorer prognosis has been reported in younger women with STEMI compared with their male counterparts. So defining chest pain as typical, atypical, and non-cardiac, which is what we often do, um, according to its relation to exercise or rest or stress, was really derived predominantly from male cohorts and is less predictive of obstructive coronary artery disease in women, especially those under the age of 65. Improving symptom evaluation tools for women could improve the detection of obstructive CAD. However, definitive data is lacking. So one could think about shifting the focus from the so-called culprit lesion, so that where the blockage is, where only an obstruction is considered to be diagnostic and where a non-obstructive lesion, uh, which is more prevalent in women, is very often uh, overlooked to the sort of culprit patient, uh, where the focus on detection of adverse indicators, such as the presence of ischemia on non-invasive testing, or the presence of atherosclerosis on, for say, uh, CT angio, uh, may improve the diagnosis, appropriate treatment and prognosis of uh, ACS in women. Um, just of note, the diagnostic accuracy to detect acute coronary syndrome and ischemic heart disease in Black, Hispanic, and a Asian and or younger women may improve if gender, which is a social construct, um, as well as psychosocial stressors, clustering of three or more risk factors, and other comorbidities are considered in addition to cardiac pains and uh, symptoms. Sorry. Not... There we go. Um, so here's some gender uh, specific data from a Canadian study. 
So among young patients in the gender and sex uh, determinants of cardiovascular disease from bench to beyond premature acute coronary syndromes, which is a mouthful, um, which is known as Genesis Proxy, much easier to say, study, um, chest pain was the most prevalent symptom in both sexes, regardless of the type of acute coronary syndrome. Women also were more likely to present with more symptoms besides chest pain compared with men. So it's recently been appreciated that younger women with acute MI are becoming increasingly uh, more common. And this has been shown in uh, observational study, both in the Genesis proxy and in an American study known as Virgo. Um, and then in the ARIC surveillance study, which looked at uh, data related to MI from 1995 to 2014 and is shown in this slide, the proportion of MI admissions for young women, age 35 to 54, increased from 21% to 31% from 1995 to 99, which was the 21%, to 2010 to 2014, which is 31%, so an increase of 10%. Whereas in men for that time period, the increase was from 30 to 33%, or just a 3% increase, so relatively stable. Of concern is that young women had a lower likelihood of uh, receiving guideline recommended treatments. Uh, female had, ha, uh, females have distinct cardiovascular risk profiles, um, including uh, female specific risk factors such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, premature menopause, or a history of preeclampsia uh, or um, gestational uh, diabetes. So these risk factors may not be integrated into risk assessments or used uh, to help define effective treatments. So the opportunity to modulate risk may be missed, which impacts on downstream outcomes. And so there's actually an emerging field now of cardio obstetrics to try to, to follow these high risk women in, in hopes to intervene earlier and prevent the long-term consequences. Because a lot of women actually don't realize that gestational diabetes and hypertension, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy do lead to long-term increased risk of heart disease. So although this data comes from surveillance study involving younger patients, these disparities in treatment have been shown in other studies involving a larger cohort, including older women. Okay, so let's just look at how we define MI. Um, so cardiac biomarkers comprise a very important element in the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. As for men, the initial test for women presenting with acute coronary syndrome is going to be an ECG and biomarkers to see what further treatment and to make the diagnosis. So the current uh, definition of MI is as follows. Um, and it updates things to include a high sensitivity uh, troponin. So the detection of a rise and or fall of cardiac troponin plus one symptom of acute ischemia, such as new ECG changes, development of Q waves, imaging evidence of new loss of myocardium or new regional wall motion malady in a pattern consistent with ischemia, and, or the identification of thrombus by angiography, including um, uh, angiography at, in vivo or at autopsy. So that's the dot, basically the definition of, uh, of an MI. So when presenting with symptoms consistent with ischemia, women are less likely to have diagnostic ECG findings and are also less likely to have ST elevation MI, as we mentioned earlier. So women uh, are less likely than men to receive care uh, within benchmark times for ECG. So the benchmark is less than 10 minutes from presentation, and it was 29% in women versus 38% in men. Um, so remember that the index ECG in the emergency room is the gateway to early uh, recognition and initiates your treatment pathway. So cardiac biomarkers are also essential to make the diagnosis of injury and solidify the diagnosis of infarction, especially if the ECG is not diagnostic as it often is. Um, so high sensitivity cardiac troponin assays are being used more often in order to improve sensitivity with the 99th percent uh, cut point of cardiac troponin uh, being how we make the, the diagnosis of an elevated troponin. Um, but the cut point in women, it, it, sorry, is higher in men than it is in women. And that's especially true at younger ages. So female specific cut points for cardiac biomarkers, which would be lower, could improve diagnosis and therefore improve outcomes. The use of sex specific troponin cut points for diagnosis of MI uh, has been shown to double the diagnosis of acute MI in women. 
This has not yet been demonstrated in larger trials. Um, as can be seen, if the ECG and or markers are not well defined in women, then there may not be an accurate and timely diagnosis of acute MI. So regarding the treatment of ACS in women, we look to the usual guideline data for um, thrombolytics and, and um, for uh, angiography with stenting or PCI. Um, and so most of the treatment guidelines are for ACS are really similar for men and women. So these are just a few little things that are a bit, a bit different and to keep in mind in women. So if you're treating uh, uh, an ST elevation MI with thrombolytics, um, there are really no sex specific recommendations, although women do have higher short term mortality and, as we mentioned earlier, a delayed presentation to hospital. For STEMI with primary PCI, if, if that's available, uh, primary PCI has lower mortality compared to thrombolytics in women. Also reduced risk of intracranial hemorrhage, but then a higher risk of complications um, in women at the site of the um, angiogram. Uh, but PCI is the preferred reperfusion strategy in both men and women, if available. Um, a few other things to note. So in non-STEMI, again, women have more non-STEMI than, than STEMI. Uh, an early invasive strategy is preferred in high-risk women in order to reduce mortality and recurrent MI. And for bypass treatment uh, in ACS, women have a higher in-hospital mortality compared to men, but really there's no, no sex-specific recommendations. So with this in mind, what can we do to improve adherence to these therapies? And are there ways to improve our invasive assessment of women presenting with acute coronary syndrome? So let's look at treatments. Um, so aspirin and other antiplatelet agents reduce the risk of recurrent ischemic events. Antithrombotic agents such as heparins reduce the risk for thrombotic complications were indicated. Increased risk of bleeding complications with such agents um, is present. And so careful attention to weight and renal uh, function uh, calculations are really important, especially in women. Women should be managed with the same core therapies as men for acute coronary syndrome acutely and for long-term secondary prevention. Smoking cessation is very important that it is one of the most modifiable um, risk factors that has a great um, impact. And then referral to cardiac rehab and cardiac rehab is my other hat. So uh, women tend to be under referred and dropout rate is higher. Um, and so we strongly suggest that uh, women um, be encouraged to, um, to, to both initiate cardiac rehab and then continue with cardiac rehab to complete the sessions um, as it does lower um, long-term, uh, it does improve long-term outcome. Um, so a few little things about some medications uh, and metabolism and effects in women. So women are almost twice as likely to be ACE inhibitor intolerant, so to have side effects. Um, as you probably know, ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, are contraindicated in pregnancy. They're teratogenic. Um, although ASA is, of course, uh, used both in men and women in secondary prevention, the effects of ASA are much more variable in women. Women are less likely to be prescribed beta blockers in uh, that's been shown across several studies. And then statins are equally effective in both men and women. Um, so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'm just just want to make a, a point with it. So this comes from a, a registry in uh, the United Kingdom and looked at 700,000 patients with acute MI, um, and it found that the provision of care across, to, across uh, defined quality indicators that you can see on the right uh, was lower for women than men. So if you adjust for baseline ischemic risk, women had higher rates of early mortality than men, and differences in the attainment of the quality indicators mediated some of these differences in 30-day survival. So women with acute MI and ACS have worse outcomes than men related to differences in comorbidity burden, clinical presentation, but also delivery of care. And so what this study implies is that an enhanced awareness to guideline indicated care has the potential to reduce some of the sex dependent mortality gap. So a quick little focus on, um, on indigenous health uh, in, uh, as it pertains really to women. Um, so this, uh, these, this comes from a heart and stroke report on women's heart health from 2018. 
Um, so Indigenous people in Canada, so that's First Nations, Métis and Inuit, are up to two times more likely to develop heart disease. Coronary heart disease is responsible for a 53% higher death rate in Indigenous women compared with non-Indigenous women. Indigenous women die from heart disease at a younger age compared to non-Indigenous women. Um, indigenous leaders say their communities are in a state of health crisis, as we all know, Ex um, access to diagnosis, treatment and supports um, is a major issue. Poverty, education, access to affordable food and water and unsafe living conditions have created a widening health gap. Currently, there is a research gap as well, indicating an urgent need for further study and a better understanding of how these factors impact Indigenous women. So generational trauma, high stress environments created by the impacts of historical policies have resulted in a disparate burden of risk factors in heart disease and stroke in Indigenous women. They are further affected by the high rate of inequities and by systemic racism. So from 2011 to 2014, elevated rates of cardiovascular disease were reported in Canada among First Nations at 16.7%, Métis at 17.1%, and Inuit at 17.9% women, compared to non-Indigenous women at 14.4%, with many studies identifying a two to threefold greater experience of heart disease and stroke among the Indigenous populations. Available research indicates that experiences among Indigenous women with respect to heart health are increasing, unlike the declining or plateauing experiences among non-Indigenous women. Risk profiles as well for, for cardiac disease are unique in the indigenous population with greater rates of elevated cholesterol, dyslipidemia, blood glucose, diabetes, and obesity compared to non-indigenous women. And as I mentioned earlier, indigenous women also experience social, economic, and political inequality, which contributes to their elevated health risk. Colonial impacts of residential schools, domestic violence, discrimination, racism, and loss of culture influence the physical health and carry across generations, contributing to intergenerational trauma. Access to healthcare systems and structures for Indigenous people in Canada is hampered by limited accountability, fragmented delivery and jurisdictional ambiguity, and insufficient medical coverage, and is further challenged through displacement of indig Indigenous people and a lack of access uh, to medical care. In summary, uh, Indigenous women in Canada experience elevated rates of uh, cardiovascular disease and of risk factors. Um, so this depicts the unique determinants of health as both as proximal, distal, uh, intermediate and distal uh, from unaffordable drug costs through poor access to health care out to colonization. And on, in, on the blue side, the right side, um, how supports that would decrease these could affect uh, could have effect on cardiac disease, such as self-determination, trust, social support, and education. Okay, so here's the summary. So regarding treatment of acute coronary syndrome, women are less frequently referred for guideline approved therapy during ACS compared with men, despite improved survival derived from such treatment strategies. Women have worse outcomes than men despite appropriately utilizing these upfront strategies, likely because of other complicating risk factors. Yet women have more favorable outcomes with primary PCI for STEMI compared to thrombolytics and derive benefit from an early invasive strategy for non-ST elevation MI. Pharmacotherapies are similarly beneficial in men and women, especially the core elements of post-MI care. Despite all this, and because the lack of women enrolled in pivotal trials, there remains persistent knowledge and management gaps. All right, so I'm gonna give you the, the key messages here. Um, so here are the takeaways. One, women are less likely to recognize their risk of development of coronary artery disease or be previously assessed for cardiovascular disease risk. Men and women interpret their symptoms very differently. Atypical and non-chest pain presentations, including uh, acute MI is more common in women than in men, but chest pain is still the most common symptom in both. Women presenting with MI tend to be older, have more comorbidities, and younger women with MI, however, are becoming more common and present their own unique challenges for diagnosis and the use of guideline recommended treatments. And we'll talk about that in a second. 
For the medical management of Q coronary syndrome, MI in women is more often lethal regardless of age or comorbidity, even in the current era. Few women are enrolled in trials and there's little information on sex specific side effects or risks. More contemporary data shows less disparity and results are often now analyzed by sex, so that's a positive. Adherence to ACS protocols, including long-term secondary prevention will translate into improved outcomes. For example, as I mentioned earlier, um, more cardiac rehab. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the tables around. I'm not gonna put anyone on the spot, um, but I have a few questions. So um, you can answer them in your head and then I'll, I'll pose the question and then I'll pose the answer. And then we're gonna go to part two of the, of the talk. Okay, so name three possible patho pathophysiologic mechanisms for ACS in women. And if I was smart, I'd have like the Jeopardy theme song going on now, but I don't, I'm not. Okay, so I'll give you five. So there's plaque rupture, similar to men, leading to coronary occlusion. There's plaque erosion, which is more common in women, and that's the discontinuation of the endothelium without evidence of plaque rupture. There's spontaneous coronary artery dissection, more common in younger women coronary artery spasm, and microvascular dysfunction. Next question. What comorbidities are more likely to occur in women with ACS? A, hypertension, B, diabetes, C, heart failure, D, depression, E, renal dysfunction, and F, all of the above. Give you a couple of seconds. So the answer of course is all of the above. Question three, true or false? Chest pain is the most common symptom of ACS in women. The answer is true. So chest pain is the most common symptom of ACS in both men and women. Question four, in which of the following age categories is ACS now more prevalent in women than it was in previous years? A, less than 55 years old, or B, more than 55 years old? The answer, less than 55. So it's increasing in younger women. All right, this one's a mouthful. I'm gonna to try to go slowly. So which statement is true concerning core therapy. So that's aspirin, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, statins for ACS. So A, core, those core therapies provide similar long-term benefits in both men and women and are prescribed as often to both, both acutely and at discharge. B, those th these therapies do not provide similar long-term benefit in men and women and are prescribed as often to both. C, these core therapies provide similar benefits in men and women and are prescribed less often. Or D, these core therapies do not provide similar long-term benefit and are prescribed less often. So similar and as often, not similar and as often, similar less often, not similar less often. Confusing, hope not. So the answer is C. So the long-term benefits of those core therapies are similar in men and women with risk reductions for major adverse cardiac events in the range of about 20 to 30%. However, women are about 10 to 15% less likely to be treated acutely or at hospital discharge uh, on these evidence-based therapies for acute coronary syndromes. Okay, so we do have time. Um, so I'm going to just go into a little more detail on Minoka because it is uh, an emerging uh, diagnosis. You're gonna see a lot more of it. Um, and it's a new term um, that um, I think merits uh, just a little bit more discussion. So I'm gonna start again with a case study. Um, so a 54 year old Asian uh, female arrives in the emergency department with shortness of breath, indigestion and dizziness. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis and depression. And she tells you that she had normal coronary angiogram six months ago. And you ask, wait a second, 
why did you have a coronary angiogram six months ago? And she said, well, I had, I had the same chest discomfort uh, six months ago and they did an angiogram and they told me it was not my heart. Okay. All right, so here's her ECG. Um, and as you can see, normal sinus rhythm, no ischemic changes, not like our first case, it's not obvious. Um, so you do um, a high sensitivity cardiac troponin and um, her initial one is 15. And in your lab, the upper limit of normal is 14. So borderline. And you say, okay, uh, I'm gonna keep you here and I'm gonna repeat your troponin in three hours and it comes back at 200. And so she's diagnosed with um, uh, non-ST elevation MI and referred to cardiology. Okay, so I'm gonna just go over the diagnosis again of MI, we went through this. So it's all those symptoms or uh, evidence on, a, on uh, diagnostics of um, ischemia or a new wall motion abnormality. But here's the, the, the clincher that I just wanna uh, bring home is really with the troponin. So uh, you need to have, uh, so the detection of troponin above the 99th percentile upper reference limit or a 20% change in troponin is diagnostic. Um, and so there's, there's two types of, of MI, I'm not going to go into the detail, but basically type one is thrombus, as we've just been talking about most common, and then type two is supply demand uh, mismatch, which is not uh, related to, to thrombosis, and I'm not going to talk about. So for, for both types of MI, the troponin rise has to be accompanied with, as, as we mentioned earlier, so symptoms of ischemia, new ECG changes, new Q waves, um, evidence on of wall motion abnormalities or evidence on angiography. So we've been through that. So when the ECG is non-diagnostic, you have to rely on your troponin. And so women are less likely to have diagnostic ECG ch changes and less likely to have definitive ST elevation. So the cardiac troponin becomes a lot more important and are, are being used more often to improve sensitivity and to try to get your, your diagnosis. Um, so according to some trials, the women's cut point um, in one trial was 16 versus 34 in men. So the cut point for women is much lower than men. Uh, but the 99th percentile cut point that you get in your, in your, on your lab sheet um, was really based on uh, cut points for, for men and not for women. So female specific lower cut point for markers could improve the diagnosis and outcome, but has not been looked at in, um, in uh, clinical, uh, in, in big clinical trials yet. Okay, so back to our case. So normal ECG, big change in troponin. So we've made a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, but wait a minute, she had an angiogram six months ago, which was normal. So she doesn't have obstructive coronary disease. So I'm gonna introduce this new terminology. Um, so the NOCA part of all those is no obstructive coronary arteries. So ANOCA, angina with no obstructive coronary arteries, INOCA, ischemia with no obstructive coronary arteries, and MINOCA, MI with no obstructive coronary arteries. So, so it's just easier to say ANOCA, INOCA, MINOCA than all those extra words. So that's, I'm gonna continue on with the acronyms. So MINOCA makes up, up to 14% of all acute coronary syndromes. And the typical patients are usually younger. Um, average age is about 52. Women are five times more likely than men to have MINOCA. And then Black, Hispanic, and Pacific race are more at risk for MINOCA as well. Um, patients have less of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors and are more likely to have hypercoag states or to develop heart failure with um, preserved ejection fraction. Oh my goodness, my. There we go. So the diagnosis, uh, the di di I'm not sure why this is. My computer has just taken over. Um, so the ANOCA diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria is stable, chronic, typical or atypical anginal symptoms, evidence of ischemia on an ECG or other imaging, um, absence of obstruction on a coronary angiogram, uh, 
And, and that's defined as um, no stenosis above 50% or fractional flow reserve, don't worry about that, of more than 0.8. So basically you do the angiogram, there's no blockage more than 50%, but you have all the symptoms and, and otherwise uh, signs of uh, ischemia. Um, so for MINOCA, so the MI, it's the usual AM, oh my goodness, the usual AMI criteria, there's a poltergeist or something changing my slides. The, so the usual AMI, AMI criteria that we've gone over, troponins, so evidence of MI with no obstruction above 50% on angiography and no other cause is found. So some sort of mimics could be like pulmonary embolism, sepsis, acute kidney injury, myocarditis. So you got to make sure that you've ruled those things out as well. So um, again, uh, just to show you that this is a, a work in progress, there's a, a few different types of algorithms that have been proposed. Um, so once the diagnosis is made, then review of the angiogram is done to check for anything that you've missed, like dissection. Um, and then there's, based on this algorithm, you would do a hemoglobin, CRP, D-dimers, BNP, and then if, uh, if necessary, uh, work up for hypercoagulable state uh, with a thrombophilia panel. Um, and that's just to rule out other causes. Um, and then an echo to look at LV function and to rule out uh, Takotsobu, which is uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Um, so, if, and if the etiology is still unclear, then a cardiac MRI would be done or, and or a transesophageal echo. So a lot of invasive uh, treatment or uh, diagnostic assays. So this is from the American Heart Association 2019. They call it the traffic light workup, the red, yellow, and green. Um, so once again, once you've determined that you've got, had an MI with no obstructive coronary arteries as your working diagnosis, um, the first step is an angiogram, um, and if it's negative, then you go on to do an echo. Um, and in, th in this algorithm, the next step would be a cardiac MRI, which is really considered the gold standard because um, it can rule out Takotsobu, it can look at my, uh, rule out myocarditis, other entities. Um, but then there's uh, there's other things you can do at the time of angiography, like intravascular ultrasound or um, OCT, which is optical coherence tomography. Again, I don't want to bog you down with all this other stuff, just to know that, again, a work in progress, there's lots of different tests that need to be done to rule this out. Um, and people are now working on uh, guidelines um, and position statements in this regard. So um, more to come. Um, so just a quick little thing about cardiac MRI, which I know is not available in most places, um, but this looked at 225 people who or patients who came in with acute chest pain uh, and then followed for 10 years. It's just an interesting thing. So these people had chest pain, a positive troponin and a negative angiogram, so no obstruction. And they went, uh, underwent a cardiac MRI within seven days. And so with cardiac MRI, the etiology was diagnosed in 86%. Uh, Minoka cases comprised 22% of the cohort. And then the etiologies differed after cardiac MRI and that had prognostic significance because you treat different things differently like Takutsobu would be treated differently than acute MI. Um, and if you look at the left side at the, you can see that uh, Takutsobu cardiomyopathy, which is the green line, and Minoka, which is the red line, had the highest mortality as compared to myocarditis, which was blue. So the overall yearly mortality was 1.4% uh, overall. For Takutsobu, it was 6.4%. For MI, it was 2.5%, and it was 0.4% for myocarditis. So the 2.5% mortality at one year for Minoka patients is similar to those uh, MI patients with obstruction. Um, so here, this showed that early cardiac MRI did have a role to play. Um, so there's different subtypes of Minoka. So Minoka can be caused by uh, vasospasm, it can be caused by microvascular dysfunction, and it can be caused by thrombosis due to hypercoag states. So all the workup is different and the treatment obviously is different. Um, and I'm again, not gonna go, go into the weeds 
Um, and so management, of course, depends on what the mechanism is. So if it's plaque rupture or erosion, it's the usual ACS medical treatment. If it's spasm, you would use calcium channel blockers preferentially or nitrates um, and consider statins. And if it's microvascular dysfunction, usually you treat with the typical anti-anginals, but that there may be a role for other things like renolazine or dipyridamol. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail that, about that. So just remember the WISE study we talked about earlier. Um, so again, this was 936 women who were referred for angiography. Um, this was published in 2017. It's widely referenced, which is why I'm showing it to you on multiple occasions. Um, so 20% of the women died within 10 years of obstructive coronary artery disease. One third died of non-obstructive. Uh, Minoka had a similar one-year mortality rate around 2%. So we said 2.5 in the other study. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, and the rate of recurrent angina was similar at about 25% for both obstructive and non-obstructive. So in people who do, uh, in which you make the diagnosis of Minoka, um, a finding of reduced ejection fraction or, and ST depression on initial ECG were uh, associated with poor long-term survival. Um, and of these most were on beta blockers, but only 38% were on uh, other um, AHA or CCS recommended therapies for heart failure, including ACEs, ACE inhibitors and uh, ARBs or angiotensin receptor antagonists. So again, I'm gonna go through some key messages and then I'm gonna turn the tables and ask you some questions and then I'll open everything up for questions. Okay, so the key messages here uh, are that Minoka should be considered in young women presenting with chest pain equivalent and no risk factors, no, no traditional risk factors. Always exclude ACS mimics like pulmonary embolism, sepsis, acute kidney disease, myocarditis. Further invasive testing, including cardiac MRI and other, uh, other things that you would do uh, during angiography is, is most often necessary. Management is dependent on the subtype of Minoka and mortality is equivalent to MI in the short term, but rises annually compared with obstructive coronary artery disease. So there still exists significant gaps in the care of Minoka patients. How do we identify these women at risk of ischemic heart disease with non-obstructive uh, coronaries, especially since they typically have non-traditional or no cardiovascular risk factors? So there's a need to develop a diagnostic algorithm that incorporates the mechanisms uh, and identifies the appropriate management pathways. And again, everyone's looking at this in the, cardio in the cardiology um, world. And then a final question is, what leads some women with uh, INOCA to progress to MINOCA uh, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Because there is an association there. Okay, so again, questions, I'll leave you a few seconds uh, to mull it over and then I'll give you the answers. So which statement is true? A, women with acute coronary syndrome are more likely to have a diagnostic ECG rather than a troponin rise compared to men. B, women with acute coronary syndrome have higher changes in troponin than men. Whoops. Men with acute ACS have a higher total, I gave it away. Uh, troponin rise than women. I'm not sure why my sides keep changing on their own. I'll give you a few seconds. You already saw the answers. <laughs> the answer is C. So men with acute coronary syndrome uh, tend to have a higher total troponin rise than women. Women tend to have non-diagnostic ECG versus men. So A is incorrect and B is incorrect because men have higher total troponins. So again, the cutoff point for troponins in men and women um, should really be different. Okay, true or false? Women with Minoka also have traditional cardiovascular risk factors. Ah, the answer is false. They tend to have less cardiovascular risk factors. True or false? Inoka is considered a form of angina with less than 50% coronary stenosis on angiography. The answer is true. And four, which statement is true? A, Minoka is diagnosed by conventional angiography. B, echo is superior to cardiac MRI at making the diagnosis. 
or C, cardiac MRI can reclassify patients with non-obstructive coronaries and lead to focused treatments? The answer is C. Whoops. So CMRI is about 90% accurate and can discern myocarditis and other cardiomyopathies and guide further therapy. So A was incorrect because, because conventional angiography can determine that there's no obstruction, but doesn't give you the actual cause. Uh, B is incorrect because cardiac MRI uh, is more accurate than echo. And then treatment is obviously based on what you find. Okay, I'm going to open things up to questions. Um, see if I can. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat box yet, but if anyone wants to unmute themselves, they can ask directly. Uh, do you have a favorite risk stratification tool for women like um, frame and hand? Yeah. So again, women, so all the risk scores have all been validated in uh, men. Um, so the one, the one uh, risk score that is um, a bit better in women is something called the Reynolds risk score. It didn't, you have to use uh, CRP because it, it did have women in the validation score. So it's not very commonly used, um, but it, so the answer is none of them. If you're going to pick one for women, the Reynolds risk score is a little bit more predictive, uh, but again, you need a, you need a CRP in order to, to um, calculate the score. Um, so yeah, like many things, you know, everything was, was studied in men and, um, we, we've extrapolated to women, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily true. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Kathy, are you I'm monitoring sure. the chat? Yeah, there's one okay. in the chat. Can you comment on C-reactive protein as a predictor of CVD in women? Yeah, so it does have a, again, goes back to the Reynolds risk score, which does include CRP. Um, so it does have some predictive value in, uh, in women, whether it's more uh, predictive in women than men, unclear, um, but is useful, yes, as a risk score. Can you comment on um, access to invasive or stratification rates and access to revascularization rates? in uh like at least in the south uh these days are things uh improving that way so still there's still a gap um so even even though we you know we're, we're trying to to educate and uh and, and try to improve access there's still a there's still a gap between access um to access to care presentation for care, and then uh, invasive strategies are still less common in women than in men. It, it's, a, it's better than it was 10 or 20 years ago, for sure, but still, there's still a gap, for, yes. And I think that's, that, that'll also vary by by province, by location. So women who, not just women, but, but certainly women who live in rural or remote areas have less access um, and more delays to, um, to care and less invasive strategy for sure. Okay, another question in the chat is, what is the latest on HRT and heart disease in women? Um, so HRT is a big, uh, a big topic. Um, so if you're, we, we know that, um, so women specific uh, risk factors do include things like um, hormonal therapies. And in fact, um, yeah, um, um, aids to conception. Um, so in vitro fertilization and all the hormonal treatment that occurs with that does actually is showing a little, uh, an uptick in long-term cardiovascular disease. So we know that things like polycystic ovarian disease, um, hypertensive diseases in pregnancy and, uh, gestational diabetes. So, so those kinds of hormonal issues in pregnancy, all increase cardiovascular disease. Um, if you're talking about post-menopausal hormone replacement therapy. Um, so as far as benefit to cardiac disease, uh, I, I don't think we would use 
hormonal therapy for cardiac, you know, to improve cardiac risk. Um, so there's, you know, based on, on the women's health initiative and all the other studies that were done years ago, um, is that, I'm not sure if that's the, if that answers that question. Dr. Wilson, did you want to unmute and maybe let us know if there's anything further? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so it's not considered a risk factor. It may be beneficial, but you wouldn't use it uh, as a preventative measure. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would use, I mean, uh, I would use hormone replacement therapy for symptomatic treatment if necessary, um, but not for not for someone who had you know cardiac disease and to try to lower their risk. If that is that what you meant? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in menopause. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the big thing so there's two there's all these things that I <laughs> my my little pet pet projects, um, so. I think a big thing that is missed uh, again is is women who have have these complications that I mentioned in pregnancy, who you say, oh, okay, well you're no longer pregnant, you're fine, um, but 20 years down the road or even 10 years down the road, their risk is increased, and and I think that is being um, that's being missed. Um, so I I strongly encourage if you have a practice in obstetrics. Um, that you're, or you're following women, young women in, in your practice that um, have had these complications, so hypertension, diabetes, um, that they get monitored on a regular basis for emergence of cardiac risk factors, and then that any symptoms that could be consistent with cardiac disease are taken seriously. That's number one. And then the other, my other thing is, is the cardiac rehab on the flip end, on the secondary prevention end, because women they're really underrepresented in cardiac rehab and that's across the board. Um, and even worse though, in rural areas because of access. I'm not sure if you have cardiac rehab, Perry Sound probably. We do have cardiac rehab. Um, yeah. is, that, is that felt to be simply because they're sort of too busy taking care of everyone else or? So yes, it's multifactorial. So one, it's a lack of knowledge of the benefits and two, yes, women are, are tend to be the caretakers, right? So they're looking after the kids, the parents, the house, the work, whatever. Um, and so they put themselves, women tend to put themselves last. Um, so it's a combination of not realizing the benefit not putting yourself first and not putting themselves first um, and not realizing just, you know, how much they can benefit from cardiac rehab and then access. So, you know, if you're a single parent who works, it's very difficult to attend cardiac rehab. So we're working on, we're working on now. The one good thing that, that COVID did was it brought us, you know, all sorts of models of remote care. And so we've done that with cardiac rehab as well. I think you mentioned to me prior to presenting today that there was uh, some online modules. Yeah, so uh, thank you for reminding me. So um, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, so cwhaj.ca is the website. There are loads of resources there. So we have nine modules. They are free of charge. You just have to register. Um, you have to do a little evaluation. They are accredited through the Royal, uh, through the CCS, but it's Royal College, so that would work for um, CCFP as well. Um, so they're accredited. They're free. There's nine of them. They go through things like cardiac cardiovascular risk factors in women. There's ACS. There's heart failure. There's a whole one on Minoka. I presented most of it. There's one on spontaneous coronary artery dissection, uh, chest pain in women. Um, trying to think what else I'm forgetting something. Oh, cardiac rehab. Um, and so they're really, you know, you can go through them in half an hour, 
uh, there, you can either do it, there's, there's someone, you know, talking at you, or you can just look at the slides and uh, read the, you know, you can do, you do one or the other. But if you actually go through the webinar part, the module, uh, at the end, there's an evaluation, there's these same questions, uh, same kind of format, there's a case study, there's a, a video from a woman with lived experience, and um, then you get credit at the end. So, so that's good. And then the Atlas, again, each chapter is really, I find it's very well done. There's some, those infographics I showed at the beginning. Um, there's a lot of useful information if you are um, interested in uh, women's heart health. Thank you, Kathy, for reminding me. I wanted to make the plug, but I forgot. <laughs> So Dr. Wilson's also put into the chat, um, cardiac rehab with daycare or elder care? Yeah, in a perfect world, yes. Um, so you're asking, it, does that exist? Uh, not that I know of. Um, I'm not sure in the bigger, in the bigger centers, uh, like in Toronto, if they have that. Um, but yes, ideally, that would be an amazing idea. It wasn't a question, it was a comment. Oh, yeah. Okay, we do have another question. If the ACS is not due to plaque rupture slash erosion, is using medication to stabilize slash prevent plaque? Yeah, we, we use the same medication, yes. It's a different pathophysiology, but we, at this point, um, still use the same treatments that you would use. It's, it's more of a, it's, it's more of an observation than it is anything else, but it's still endothelial dysfunction and it's still treated with the ASA and um, PGY-12s and the beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, et cetera. Not sure if Dr. Twin had a question for you as well, or sorry, pop up, but I didn't see her on mute. Any other questions from anybody in the group? Dr. Bear, I just wanted to say a quick thank you and a hello from a fellow mayor timer. I'm Victoria Smith. I'm um, daughter of Luella Smith, who you might know. Oh, she's Luella! Say How is hello. Okay. <laughs> Where is she? Uh, she's currently in uh, Fort Simpson, but all over the north these days. Wow. Oh, please say hi to her for me. Will do. She wanted me to say uh, hello to you. Uh, your mom's a, an amazing woman. That's all I have to say. Thanks. We think so too. Oh yeah. Are you, I, well, I used to hear, I used to hear stories about you guys and all your orienteering. And those days are uh, <laughs> over for now. <laughs> Oh yes, send her, send her my, my kindest regards, a big hug for me, and I hope all is well. Thanks very much, and thanks so much for your presentation. Oh, uh, you're welcome. You just warmed my heart. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone else um, with questions, so thank you very much for presenting today. I know I certainly learned a lot. Um, been a while since I've worked in critical care, but I've certainly learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation and for bearing with me and for listening to my voice for so long and all that sort of stuff. Um, and good luck with everything and uh, stay safe and stay healthy and all those things. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Thank, okay. thank you again for inviting me. I hope that was okay and uh, wasn't too much. No, it was perfect, I think. Okay, good. Um, it was awesome. Thank you. Um, can you send me the uh, PowerPoint? I'll send you a PDF of, yeah, and I've got some extras. Yeah, I'll send you a PDF of everything. Okay, perfect. Okay. The link to the um, modules. I will do that. 
Okay, perfect. Send it in an email. It might not be just right this minute, but I will do it before before tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. You too.